Well, happy Sabbath, everyone. It's good to have uh, everyone here today. Um, today's message is entitled Rejecting the Son of God. And the reason why I, I have decided to speak on this today is that, as I was telling some of you earlier, is that I was um, looking at, uh, I was, you know, after my devotion, and I um, was on my exercise listening to, you know, the first chapter of the Great Controversy, where it talks about the um, destruction of Jerusalem, and you know, not so much of the destruction of Jerusalem, but it went into the result of the choice that the Jewish people had made that in rejecting Jesus as the Son of God. And it got me to thinking about um, really what, you know, that meant, you know, how is it that they, you know, it, you have a people who for hundreds of years had the oracles of truth. They, had the, they understood prophecy. They understood that Jesus was, you know, the Messiah was going to come. They, um, they knew all, all sorts of things that the Bible talked about. They had the, the sacrificial system. They had the law. And so they, they had an understanding of what was to come. Yet, how is it that this group of people were so unprepared to, um, to receive the Messiah that they had put, been proclaiming for hundreds and hundreds of years? And so, you know, when Jesus came the first time, they didn't expect him to come the way that he did, even though the Bible clearly foretold the manner of which he would come, and that the whole reason why he would come was that he was to die. In fact, the very sacrificial system that they would partake of every single day pointed forward to the coming of the Messiah and what his role and mission was to do, was to die for their sins. So it's very strange how this group of people were not ready for the first coming. And in fact, they were so unprepared, they were so ch uh, changed in their way of thinking that they rejected the, the Son of God, not just rejected him, they actually crucified him. Now, I know that this is not something that is news to every one of us. And of course, being a Christian, we understand what the Jews had done. But the, the problem comes is that here in our day and age, we look back in that time of the Jews and we think to ourselves, you know what? We are much smarter than they are. They, they, we have more information. We understand the gospel so much better than they did before. Yet, even today, the, um, you know, the, the, the whole of the Christian world has rejected Jesus as the Son of God. It's, um, you know, how is it that, that we today, who have the, the very Gospels of Jesus Christ, you know, we have Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and we have all of the writings of the Apostle Paul. We have the writings of, of, um, of um, one of the Apostles, John. You know, his um, depiction, his rendering of what had happened, and he also, they also gave us um, guidance on how we are to move forward. And so, you know, when we, when we think about that, we, you know, of the time in the past, I'd like to kind of just take a little bit of um, comparing of what happened in the past versus what's happening here today. Now, one of the things that um, happened first off was John the Baptist. Now, there was someone that was called a forerunner, a forerunner of Christ, someone that was to go away, go ahead of Christ and to prepare the way. Now, as I, you know, we have studied in the past, um, whenever a king or a monarch or someone very important was coming to, um, to their area, they would prepare the way for him. Now, what the preparation was, now, in those times, the roads weren't always as nice as, you know, say, some of the roads are today. And so, they would go out and they would smooth the roads. And so if, if there was um, a, a bunch of inclines, they would, they would um, make it uh, straighter. If there was a bunch of potholes in the road, they would fill them. And uh, 
you know, they would, they would do all kinds of things to prepare it so that the way could be easy. Well, the forerunner that came in before Jesus was John the Baptist. And it says in um, John chapter one, so turn with your Bibles, if you will, to John chapter one, and we're going to read just a few verses, uh, 19 through 23. And it says, um, and turn there, because I'm going to ask uh, someone else to read uh, a couple other verses. So just be prepared for that. Um, it says in John chapter one, verses 19 through 23, it says, and this is the record of John. When the Jews sent priests and Levites from Jerusalem to ask him, who art thou? And so the, John the Baptist was, did not go to the, the synagogues and he didn't go to the, the, the priests and the leaders of the Jews and ask them permission so that he can present this message to prepare the way of the Messiah. What he actually did as he went out into the wilderness, and he preached this message of repentance. He said, repent for the kingdom of God is at hand. And what happened was people would come out of the Jerusalem and would go out to meet him and see him <laughs> out in the wilderness. And when he preached this message, now a congregation of Levites um, from Jerusalem they asked him, who art thou? Because they thought, because they, they were all looking for the Messiah. Now, one of the things that the prophecies did for the Jewish people is that they knew that the prophecy of the coming of the Messiah was at hand. And so they were actually looking for him. The problem was, is that that who they were looking for was not the same person that was to come. And that's kind of the question that we're going to be looking at here today is how could they have missed it? So I'm going to go on and read, and it says in uh, John 1.20, it says, And he confessed and denied not, but confessed, I am not the Christ. So what he was saying, he's, he wasn't saying, I am not Jesus Christ. He was saying is that I am not the Christ. Now notice it says the Christ and not just Christ. He said, I am not the Christ. I am not the Messiah. I am not the Son of God. I'm not the one that is to come. And that's what John the Baptist was preaching to the people. And it had such power with the people that it drew them away from the scribes and the Pharisees, from the Levites, from the religious leaders of their time. And it was drawing so many people that um, they sent a congregation to ask him, are you the, the one that is to come? Are you the Messiah? And John's told him straight out, I am not the coming Messiah. And it says in Verse 21, it says, and they asked him, what then, art thou Elias, meaning the, the prophet uh, Elijah? And he saith, I am not. Art thou, a, uh, art thou that prophet? And he answered, no. Then said they unto him, who art thou? So like, who are you then? That we may give an answer to them that sent us. Notice that they were sent to find this out. What sayest thou of yourself? And notice what he said. He said in verse 23, he said, I am the voice of one crying in the wilderness. Now, he was, he was speaking about a prophecy to bring their minds back to the prophecies uh, of the Old Testament that they already knew. And he said, make straight the way of the Lord, as said the prophet um, Isaiah, or basically Isaiah, the way we say it today. And so he was quoting what the prophet Isaiah had said. He says, I'm here to prepare the way for the Lord, for the Messiah. Now, I'm going to ask Brother Romy, if you will, to read verses 29 through 34. So John chapter 1, verses 29 through 34. The next day... The next day John seeth Jesus coming unto him and saith, Behold the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world. This is he of whom I said, After me cometh a man which is preferred before me, for he was before me, and I knew him not, but that he should be made manifest to Israel. Therefore am I come baptizing with water, and John bare record saying, I saw the spirit descending from heaven like a dove, and it abode upon him. And I knew him not, 
but he that sent me to baptize with water, the same said unto me, Upon whom thou shalt see the Spirit descending and remaining on him, the same is he which baptizeth with the Holy Ghost. And I saw and bear record that this is the Son of God. Amen. Thank you, my brother. Now, you notice here is that John was pointing forward to the Messiah himself. He said, Behold, the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world. Now, they had been practicing and practicing and practicing the sacrificial service for so many centuries. And now was this Messiah there with him. But notice what he said in verse 34. And he says, and I saw and bear record that this is the Son of God. So he presented before them the Messiah, the Son of God. And so what was Jesus' work when he was here? Now, um, there are just, a, you know, there, I, I'm just pulling a few verses, and I'm just reading the very first part of it so that we can get an idea of what Jesus' mission and work was. He said, behold, the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world. And Jesus said, he said, repent, for the kingdom of God is at hand. Or he might even, I think he might have said it, repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Notice what he says. Um, that's what he's, yeah. In Mark 1.15, says, the time is fulfilled, and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent ye and believe the gospel. So you have two things here. You have, you have the Messiah coming as the Son of God, and then you have the gospel, right? He says, so that's what Jesus said in Mark 1.15. Now, in Matthew 13.24, now I'm just going to read a couple of these verses pretty quickly, because I, I want to bring it to a point. <coughs> Excuse me. In Matthew 13, 24, it says, And another parable put he forth unto them, saying, The kingdom of heaven is likened unto a man which sowed good seed in the field. And so, <coughs> excuse me, so there are many times when Jesus was talking before the people, he was saying, he would say to them things like, The kingdom of heaven is like unto. And so he was trying to reveal to them the kingdom of God because he was trying to share with them um, something that they did not uh, recognize before. And so he was revealing to them, not just the Father, but what the kingdom of God was like. Notice in Matthew 18, 23, it says, therefore is the kingdom of heaven likened unto. And so he was using these different examples. And this one, he says, unto a king which take account of his servants. And so he would use these parables to lead the minds of the people to know and understand what the kingdom of God was like. And notice this last one here in Matthew 25, verse 1. It says, Then shall the kingdom of heaven be likened unto ten virgins which took their lambs and went forth to meet the bridegroom. And so through all of these parables, Jesus was revealing to them the very nature of the kingdom of God. Now, what they had been receiving from the, the scribes and the Pharisees, from their religious leaders, was a very different salvation, a very different Messiah that was to come. The Messiah that they were looking for was a Messiah that would free them from the Roman oppression, that would bring them back to national greatness, and would um, and that they would rule over all of these people. Now, this was not what Jesus, this was not what the mission of Jesus was. They should have known this. So how is it, how is it that this people, this church, this group of people that have had all of these prophecies all these years got it so very wrong. And I would um, present before you the reason why this. Now, one of the other things that he did, and I'm going to tell you that in a second, but he says, but he went out to heal the sick. Didn't the, um, when John the Baptist was, was even John the Baptist himself was, um, wasn't very sure, you know, is this, did I really, you know, was this really the son of God? Was this really the Messiah was to come? Because he was in prison at this time. And so he sent his disciples out to Jesus and asked him this question. He says, art thou the, uh, the one that was to come or should we look for another? And how G Jesus didn't answer them right away. So he went out and he began to heal the sick 
the lame, the blind. And after all of the miracles that he did, he said, go back and tell John what I have done. And when John had heard that, he was completely satisfied that this was the Messiah. So his mission was to heal the sick. Didn't the prophecy say is that he would do all of these wonderful things? Now, in, in John 4, 34, the last verse that I'm going to read, when it talks about Jesus' mission, you remember the, the story of the woman at the well, when he met this woman of Samaria, and he revealed to her that he was the Messiah, right? He, um, she went out and she brought people to her or to him, even without any miracle being performed other than him revealing to her, you know, that he knew her life. And in John 4, 34, it says this, Jesus saith unto them, he's talking to the disciples because the disciples are saying, were saying, you know, Lord, you must eat. And Jesus told them, he said, I have meat to eat that, thou, that you don't even know of. Now, they didn't understand what he was actually saying. And so he said this to them. He says, my meat is to do the will of him that sent me and to finish the work. Verse 35, say ye not that there are yet four months and then cometh the harvest? Behold, I say unto you, lift up your eyes and look on the fields, for they are uh, white, all ready for harvest. And so his mission was to bring in a harvest, right? And he saw amongst the Samaritan, the despised of the Jews, a harvest that was ready to be reaped. Now, so when we, we talk about this whole thing, how is it that these people who had known all of these things rejected the very Messiah that they were professing to look for, to look for. And I kind of found the, the answer in this, um, um, in this parable. Let me find the parable that I have put down. Hold on, I will find it here. Okay, so go to the book of Matthew, chapter 13, and this parable is found verses 24 to 30, but we're going to, going to um, look at a few of the verses. It says here, Luke, on Matthew chapter 13, 24, another parable put he forth unto them, saying, the kingdom of heaven is like unto a man which sowed good seed in his field. But while men slept, his enemy came and sowed tares among the wheat, and he went his way. So what were, what, was, um, what were the tares that were sown? Now, you remember in this parable, and I just um, will kind of just look at some of the last verses of it. Um, it says in verse 26, it says, but when the blade sprung up and brought forth fruit, then appeared the tares also. So the servants of the household came and said unto him, Sir, dost thou not sow good seed in the field? From whence, <clears throat> excuse me, from whence then hath it tares or has it weeds? So where did these weeds come from? And in verse 28, he said unto them, an, an enemy hath done this. Their service said unto him, Wilt thou then go and we gather them up? But he said, Nay. So Jesus said, no, it's not time to gather up the weeds. It's not time to separate the weed, uh, wheat from the tares. He said, um, least you gather the tares and root up the wheat with them. Let both grow together until the harvest. And in the time of the harvest, I will say to the reapers, gather ye together first the tares and bind them in bundles to burn them, but gather the wheat into the barn. Now, you're very familiar with this, um, this parable. It's a it's a wonderful parable, <clears throat> but I would like to, to um, ask you, what did the tares represent? <clears throat> what did they represent? False teachers. False teachers. Exactly right. They, they, they represented lies. They represented supplanting the truth with error. What is the whole point of, of um, telling lies or deceptions? What is the whole purpose of that? To mislead people. To mislead people, right? To get them thinking in a different way. Now, you remember Lucifer. Now, he is the father of lies, right? Didn't Jesus call him the father of lies? Now, when he came to deceive Eve, 
how is it that he got, how is it that he deceived her? He entered into a conversation with her and he used a, a tactic by making a, a gross overstatement so that it would elicit her to jump in and correct him. And as soon as she jumped in to correct him, he knew that he had her because as soon as he entered into a dialogue with her, he can lead her mind into a direction that would deceive her. G uh, uh, Luc uh, Lucifer said, yea, hast thou not said that thou shalt not eat of every tree of the garden? Now, is that what Jesus said? I mean, or, or uh, the son of God said? No, he didn't say that. He said only one tree that they couldn't eat. And she was very quick to go in and um, correct him. Now, entering into this dialogue with him, he was able to change her mind, to change her thinking of God. Now, you were very right, Brother Romy, when you said um, that yes. these were deceivers, right? Go ahead. You had yeah. something you want to say? Actually, actually, the serpent made a twist of the word of the word of truth. He used the truth but he twisted it yeah. in order to deceive Eve. And it's the same thing with uh, what's happening now. Uh, the enemy is trying to twist the truth, the word of truth, in order to deceive people. That's why in the book of uh, Revelation, according to the three unclean spirit, that they are like frogs meaning that they use false doctrines. They twist the truth of the word of God in order to deceive people. Yeah. They, they use doctrines uh, that uh, as if it is the truth, but actually it is a deception. Yeah. And only people who are students of Bible prophecy who are uh, deemed to be inspired by the word of God will be able to discern it. Yeah, absolutely. So we, we know that, um, that in the time of Christ, there had been very, uh, long years where Satan was working his art of deception amongst the people, right? And it was his goal that they would not recognize and would not be prepared for the messiah when he came and he wanted to be he wanted to be he wanted christ to to be um completely rejected by the people now by the majority of the people he was rejected but by a small group of people were not deceived and they received the messiah you think of the the shepherds right who are watching their flock where the angels announce the coming of the of the messiah and you have the three wise men who um, had been looking for him and so satan's lies and deception was not able to completely um twist the people's mind to who the son of god was now um so what was it in the time of christ was supplanting that which made them reject the messiah is that they supplanted the Messiah that was to come in a different light, in a different manner. In fact, though they, they looked for him coming the first time as he would come a conqueror the second time. And he jumbled it all up so that they were desiring someone that was not coming. Now, notice that, that Satan changed their desires, right, for someone that was not to come. Um, today, he has done the very same thing in our day, and he has artfully, now notice this, he has artfully supplanted the Son of God for God the Son, a Messiah that is not the Son of God. You ever notice how um, all of the Christian uh, churches teach this very doctrine, it's called the doctrine of the Trinity, is that they say that the Son of God is only a metaphor. It's not literally true. And uh, they replaced him with a being called God the Son, who is God first 
and son second, meaning that the son is a title. It is not a literal truth. And so, although the Bible in uh, Jesus, or the, all, all throughout the Bible, Jesus is called what? The, the son, son of God, right? But they have twisted it to say God the Son. So, the Bible's declare. Now, notice in Luke chapter 135, I'm going to go through some texts really quickly here, but if you want to write them down so you can reference them later. Luke chapter 135. Um, actually, I'm going to go ahead and let Romy read this one first, and then I'll read the next one. Luke 135. And the angel answered and said, And the angel answered and said unto her, The Holy Ghost shall come upon thee, and the power of the highest shall overshadow thee. Therefore also the holy thing which shall be born of thee shall be called the Son of God. Amen. So, Speaking to Mary, the angels declared that this was the Son of God. In Matthew 16, uh, 16 and 17, um, the, you know, Simon Peter, answering for the rest of the, of the disciples, said, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. So you have the angels declaring it. You have the apostles declaring it. And notice here in Matthew 8, 29, 8, 29 is, and it's talking about the demoniac. And it says, and behold, they, talking about the, demo, the demons, cried out saying, what have we uh, to do with thee, Jesus, thou son of God? So even the demons declare that Jesus is the son of God. Now, you think that these demons, if they, um, if they wanted to deceive or if, if, if they wanted to um, unmask Jesus, right? You had the scribes and the Pharisees chasing after Jesus, trying to catch him in a lie, in a misstep, so that they could call him a sinner and then lead the people away from him. Don't you think that the demons, if Jesus wasn't really, literally, truly the Son of God, don't you think that they would call that out right very quickly and say, you aren't really the Son of God? But no, even the demons declare that this is the Son of God. Yeah. And notice in also Matthew 3.17, God himself declares, he says, and behold, they cried out saying, I'm sorry, and lo, a voice from heaven saying, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. The father himself, the, the highest authority in all the universe declares, it says, this is my son. And we know that God is not a man that he would lie. Numbers 23, 19 says this, God is not a man that he should lie, neither the son of man that he should repent. Hath he said, and shall he not do it? Hath he not spoken, and shall it not make good? And so really all of these texts are saying here is that Jesus is the son of God. Yet the Jews in the time of Christ rejected him because he claimed to be the son of God. And so you remember when, um, when he was before Caiaphas, right? And they were trying to catch him and, and find a reason that they could crucify him. And he said, you know, so he, you know, he said, he says, tell us, are you the son of God? And he said, ye say that I am. And he rent his clothes. And he said, do we need, we have any more to hear from him? He has blasphemed him. And they took him out and they brought him before Pilate. And Pilate said to them, what do you want me to do? And he said, crucify him. And so the, 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 the people in the time of Christ, the Jews who had all the oracles of truth, chanted and yelled, crucify him, crucify him. Why? Why did they want to crucify him? Because he claimed to be the son of of God. My friends, today the same thing is happening. Satan has artfully supplanted the Son of God for a altogether different being called God the Son. Now, I want to read you something here. I want to read you something in uh, our opening text that Craig had read in Matthew 10, 32. It says, whosoever therefore shall confess me now, another word for confess is acknowledge. Um, 
me before men, him will I confess or acknowledge before my Father which is in heaven. And whosoever shall deny before men, or me before men, him will I also deny before my Father. He's saying, look, if you deny that I am the Son of God, then I'm not going to uh, acknowledge you or claim your name before my Father. And so when we go in our Bibles and we look to, um, you know, how did this happen? How did this come in? And if you look in the book of Jude, Jude chapter 1. Well, there's only one book in Jude, right? So Jude chapter 1 and verse 3 and 4. So I'm going to read that for you. So Jude chapter 1, verses 3 and 4 says, Beloved, now this is Jude speaking to the people of God. It says, Beloved, when I gave all diligence to write unto you of the common salvation, it was needful for me to write it. So he says, I'm talking to you about my, our salvation, but something else I need to bring before you that is very, very important. He said, and, uh, and exhort you that ye should earnestly contend for the faith which was once delivered unto the saints. Now, why would he say that you need to earnestly contend for the faith that was given to you in the past. Hold on to it is what he's saying. The reason why he was telling them that is because it is there are going to be people come in that are going to try to twist it, just like Brother Romy had said. So in verse 4, it says, For there are certain men crept in unawares who were before of old ordained to this <clears throat> condemnation, calling them ungodly men, turning the grace of God into lasciviousness, and then noticing, notice something here. Not only would they turn the grace of God into um, lawlessness, he says, that, uh, he says, and denying the only Lord God and our Lord Jesus Christ. Now remember, Jesus Christ is not his last name. He was not Jesus' last name Christ. It was Jesus the Messiah. So Jesus, the Christ, Jesus, the Messiah, Jesus, the only begotten Son of God. And so what he was saying is that there were evil men creeping into the church that would twist and change this Son of God into someone that is, that is not the Son of God. And that, my friends, has already happened. That has been going on for for, you know, for a long time. And I'm not just talking about the Seventh-day Adventist Church. I'm talking about all of Christianity. Now, what does that mean for you and me? So if Satan has come in and has twisted our minds away from the Son of God to this other being called God the Son, what does that mean for you and me? It means this, is that if we are not looking to the son of god but we are looking unto god the son we will just as readily cry crucify him when jesus comes again now it's not going to be crucified jesus because he is going to be coming in power and, and glory but those who christ is manifesting himself through he they are going to say crucify them crucify them because they are not looking for that kind of a Messiah, they are looking unto one that was never to come. Jesus said in Matthew chapter 24, one of the, thing, one of the first things that he told them um, when um, the disciples were asking about what was going to happen in the last days, he said, take heed that no man deceive you, right? Isn't that what he said? For false Christs and false prophets will come in my name to deceive, and it also says later on, to deceive even the very elect. My friends, the very elect has already been deceived. Look in Revelation chapter 3 real quickly. This is my, I think my last verse, well, one of the last verse. In Revelation chapter 3 and verse um, 14, it says this. And unto the angel of the church of Laodicea write, These things saith the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of the creation of God. And this is basically saying the Son of God himself. He says, I know thy works, and thou art neither cold nor hot. 
I would that thou wert cold or hot. But because thou art lukewarm, now notice this, this condition of the people, they are lukewarm and neither cold nor hot. He says, I will spew thee out of my mouth. Now, what does that mean? What it means is, is that he will not confess them before his father. You remember Matthew chapter 10, verse 32 and 33. It says, if you don't acknowledge me or you don't confess me here on this earth, I will not confess your name before my father. These people are not confessing that Jesus is the Son of God. How do we know that? Well, you look on there at their condition. He says, thou art, in verse 17, thou art wretched and miserable and poor and blind and naked. And then in verse 18, it says, I counsel thee to buy of me gold tried in the fire, that thou mayest be rich, and white raiment thou, that the shame of thy nakedness do not appear, and anoint thy eyes with thy eyes out. Now notice this. One of, the, one of the remedies for this people is that they need white raiment. What is raiment? It's, it's righteousness. They need, they need the righteousness of Christ. Why do they need the righteousness of Christ? When we say the righteousness of Christ, we're saying the righteousness of the Son of God. Why do they need it? And they need it because they don't have it, because they have rejected Jesus as the only begotten Son of God. Last verse that I'm going to go to is in the book of 1 John chapter 2, verse 22 and 23. And notice what it says here. Who is a liar? Now, who is the liar? It's Satan himself. It says, who is a liar but he that denieth that Jesus is the Christ, the Messiah, the Son of God, the only begotten Son of God. He is Antichrist that denieth the Father and the Son. Whosoever denieth the Son... The same hath not the Father, but I, but he that acknowledges the Son hath the Father also. My friends, there's a lot of confusion going on in the world today. But the one thing that Satan, above all things, wants to do is to get our eyes off of Jesus as the Son of God. And on to this other being called God the Son, who is not in reality the Son of God. My friends, our only salvation is found in Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God. 1 John 5.11 says, and this is the record that God hath given us everlasting life. And that life is in his son. For as the father has life in himself, so has he given to the son to have life in himself. Comes from John um, 5.26. So my friends, if we are looking unto this false Christ called God the son, we will as surely cry, crucify them in the last days, as the Jews did in the time when the Messiah came the first time. And so I know that all of you here believe that Jesus is the Son of God. But my friends, there are so many out in the world today, in other Christian denominations, in the Seventh-day Adventist church, that do not understand this. And it is for us to share this with them. What did Jesus say? And this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached unto the whole world, and then shall the end come. In Revelation chapter 14, where we talk about the three angels' message, the first angel's message is a call back to, the, to worship the God of creation, the creator in heaven and earth, right? But that message, the first angel's message, has been twisted. You remember what Brother Romy said? What did you say? Is that they were deceivers, twisting, right? The truth. Mm -hmm. The three angels' message is a call back to the worship of the Creator, which is the Father. But our church has twisted it to say it's about the Sabbath. It's a call back for the world to worship on the seventh day Sabbath, when it doesn't say that at all. It's a twist, and therefore the focus is off of who God is 
and who the Son is unto a day of worship. So my friends, all I can tell you is this, is that the second coming is at hand. There's not much time left, and it's time for us to share this gospel to the whole world that Jesus is the Son of God. Amen? Amen. All right. So we're going we're gonna to close with a, um, a song and then a word of prayer. So I'm going to go ahead and mute myself, and, I, uh, would, and we, can, we can comment afterwards, but let's go ahead and um, let's sing our closing hymn, have a prayer, and then we can have uh, a discussion. problem to be God cannot solve it there is no mountain too tall he cannot move it there is no storm too dark God cannot call sorrow to thee he cannot soothe it. if he carried the weight of the world upon his shoulder I know my brother that he will care All right, everyone, let's bow our heads for prayer. Our kind and loving Heavenly Father, what a blessing we have received here today. Father, we are 
We've been blessed by your word. We've been blessed by your presence being amongst us, Father. Lord, we know that your coming is soon, and we know that there are so many people that Satan has deceived from receiving Jesus, the only begotten Son, as their Savior. Father, I pray that you will impress upon us, empower us, give us strength, the opportunities, and the ability to share this message with others, that they may be awakened, and that they may look away from the false deception that Satan has led them to, unto the one true God, and to yourself, through your Son, Jesus Christ. Father, we ask that you continue to be with each and every one of us here as we go our separate ways. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen.